edge devices are ubiquitous in our daily lives. Everyone in the Western world has heard of the big names, Roku, Apple TV, Amazon's Fire Stick, Google, something. We plug these devices into our televisions, connect them to Wi-Fi, and like magic, they bring entertainment into our homes. Over the internet, instead of relying on over-the-air antennas, cable boxes, or satellite dishes. They've transformed the way we consume entertainment. Cord cutting has enabled previously niche companies like Netflix to become so dominant that entire stock market indices move, in part, based on their average growth or decline in subscribers. So we'd expect large companies like Google and Amazon to be able to afford large security teams and follow security design best practices. But what about those less smart devices in our homes? The ones we connected to the internet and then maybe even forgot about, like the garage door opener or the thermostat or that alarm clock that can tell you the weather when you wake up in the morning. Even that smart plug that you picked up as conference swag that's got some company logo branded on it. Do you trust that device you paid no money for to be kept up to date and free from vulnerabilities? As security people, we think about these things and we consider the risks before connecting these devices to our home networks. If you're like me, you might even have them segmented off on your guest network. But most people don't consider these risks. And the risks in a home environment are very different than the risks in an industrial environment. That smart robot, worst case scenario, it might self-destruct if it goes haywire, but it's not gonna kill anybody. An industrial robot, on the other hand, I'm not so sure. And we're already starting to see these edge devices show up in industrial networks. They don't fit our traditional concept of what an industrial network should look like. They've kind of broken our models to some extent. Some people will say the Purdue model is dead. And if you talk to the 62443 folks, they'll say they can take that cloud and they can push it down to level zero, level one, level two in a trusted cloud environment. I'm not saying these architectures can't be secured. Certainly there are ways that it can be accomplished securely. But if you're an asset owner, you usually don't have that level of control or visibility over how that cloud is set up. But you do have very valuable data that you want to get out of your operations. Industrial systems are generating so much data. And it's only going to continue as we continue to bring more intelligence down to the plant level. Gardner estimates that by 2025, 75% of industrial data or of enterprise data is going to be generated or consumed outside of a traditional data center or cloud environment. It's happening in manufacturing. It's happening in operations. Let's look at a typical use case that we see today in a manufacturing environment for an edge device. In a high-speed manufacturing operation, products pass through many different process steps in very high speeds. Quality problems can go undetected, only to be found after that product hits retail shelves. While the manufacturer is going through the painful process of initiating a recall on a certain batch or lot, they want to know what went wrong with their process. But they need a lot of data in context to be able to do that analysis. They need to basically recreate the physics and the chemistry of what went into manufacturing that product. And the higher up in your system you go, the more context is lost. You may be able to recreate some of that context using AI or machine learning in the cloud, but it's very expensive to do it at that level. And it's also very error prone. A more efficient way to do it is to build up that data model right at the manufacturing edge collect the data from all your different PLCs and your sensors and your cameras. You know, what was the humidity, the temperatures, the flows? All time stamped together, all in context. Then when you pass that data over to your IT systems, it's much easier to work with. There's obviously bus business value here, but what about the risk? New applications are popping up on the periphery of OT networks every day. <coughs> They're accelerated by those hyperscalers, the Amazons, the Googles, the Microsofts. Customers like them because they provide 
Simple to use control and data planes. They're easy to configure, easy to install, and they have this perceived isolation between the OT systems and the IT networks. Are they truly isolated? Certainly not without significant effort. And the reality is, if that edge device gets a vulnerability, you know, it's running software just like any other computing device. That logical isolation between those systems could be compromised. The industrial data could be manipulated. It could be stolen. But these are cyber physical systems where the consequences relate to you know, health, safety, the environment. So you really need to have a patching and update strategy to pair with these edge devices. I saw one industrial vendor advertising their industrial edge gateway to connect your PLC directly to the cloud. And one of their main selling features was that their device never required software or firmware updates, so it could run four years with failure-free operation. That's terrifying. <laughs> you need to have a way to get these devices up to date at scale, depending on how large your operations are. And some of these devices store configuration settings on removable media, like an SD card. Can I walk up to that device and pop out the SD card, put in my own SD card, and reroute all that data to my cloud infrastructure? Maybe I'll even mirror the data so you don't even know that it's missing. I send you your own copy. So you have to ask those questions. How are all of those configurations being protected and stored? Now, before I go into some practical ways to control the risks and think about how you should assess them for edge devices, I first want to dispel one myth. Some manufacturers today are thinking about the cloud as if it's my cloud or managed by my IT, as if that somehow provides some measure of risk mitigation, like those computing surfaces are right here on premise. The cloud is public, Times Square at high noon. You need to assume that that data could be seen by anyone. It could be manipulated. So it better be encrypted. It better have integrity protections on it. You need to approach any data moving between operations in the cloud in a zero trust mindset. And as security professionals, this may be obvious to you. But do all of your vendors, machine builders, uh, suppliers agree with this mindset? If your facilities are in a location that gets decent cell reception, do you have any you know, service providers installing 5G modems and packing them on a skid? Do you have machines that are sending unsecured vendor to your cloud, your, your vendor's cloud? You may even want to, you know, invest in a wireless intrusion detection system so you can verify that there are no hidden edges. Or, you know, make sure you've updated your purchasing agreements to make it explicitly clear that no one is allowed to add a new internet connection to your facilities without your explicit approval. So, you know, cybersecurity, it doesn't necessarily need new methods. It always comes back to a good asset inventory, step one. Do you know where all your edges are? But then we can apply the same techniques we've applied to secure industrial facilities for years. You know, patch management, vulnerability management, <laughs> network segmentation, risk assessment, all of these same techniques can be applied to the edge. We just have to bring more awareness and, you know, highlighted impacts of <laughs> the edge device is being connected to the internet. These devices typically don't resemble your traditional computer. So they're often outside of the bounds of a traditional IT endpoint management system. So it's critical that as OT people, we're putting ICS controls on these devices just like you would for any of your other OT equipment. You know, who can control, who can access the data? What can the devices access on your network? Where do you put them in your network? Who's allowed to manage the devices and access the control plane? And just your general user role-based access control around these devices. You know, consider the data on these devices. Are you selecting edge devices that support full disk encryption? These devices are not locked in a typical data center. In many cases, they may be mounted directly up on a machine. So what's the risk if someone comes up and picks up an edge device and leaves the facility with it? Or if they Take a device and replace it with another device. Can you detect that it's been tampered with? Uh, all, of, all of these are things that need to be considered with this type of computing device. 
Let's take a look inside one of these devices. So it has hardware, an edge operating system, which is typically lighter weight than a full-blown Windows OS, and then a virtual machine running containerized apps. So starting at the hardware level, how do you know that you're working with hardware you can trust? It's critical that you select edge computing hardware that contains a trusted platform module. That technology enables you to leverage security features like a measured boot, which is a level above just a traditional secure boot, because not only does every uh, piece in the boot chain verify the signature of you know, the next piece, but it's also taking precise measurements of that specific firmware version on that specific hardware, and if it deviates too much in how long it takes to execute that chunk of code, it'll halt the boot and stop. So even if someone were able to get a hash collision and um, sneak in some modified firmware, the time deviation would change and you would detect that tampering event. In some geographies, it's not legal to buy computing hardware with TPMs. This is also something you need to consider. Uh, if you want to have a global strategy, you know, maybe it's different if you have devices that don't have TPMs. Maybe those devices can't be placed below the DMZ in your industrial environment because you don't trust them to get close enough to those low-level OT devices. Or maybe you need to buy more physical firewalls or other security appliances to place around those devices just to make sure that it, they're not able to start operating outside the bounds of what you intended. And like I mentioned before, these devices are intended to be connected to the internet. So the traditional OT argument that you don't always need the latest uh, software versions, firmware versions to guard against the latest vulnerabilities simply doesn't fly with edge devices. You need to have a way to keep these up to date. Edge orchestration is a key enabler here. It enables you to onboard, provision, secure an entire fleet of devices all across the globe at scale and to be able to keep a consistent understanding of what your security posture is. In an OT environment, we typically want to keep our legacy systems, our you know, more critical operations, very isolated from the internet and protected. You can add an edge device to your architecture and not break that. You can do it in a very IT-friendly way. If you notice on this slide the direction of all of the arrows, the edge device reaches out. The cloud manager is never going to reach inside your network to push an update, push an application. With the orchestration and the um, kind of a restful API type modern web technologies, the edge devices run a schedule and they will periodically check, out, check in with the manager to see if there's any events they need to respond to if there's any new configuration changes or firmware versions they need to grab, if there's been a change to the apps that need to be deployed, deployed on it. So you can take advantage of your existing technologies like stateful firewalls. You should be blocking all external connections coming into that facility. Only allow internally generated connections out. You'll also notice on this slide there's the use of the optional application stores either on-premise or within your corporate network. If you have critical applications that you, for whatever reason, don't want to be stored in a cloud environment, you don't have to. And you can still orchestrate and manage your entire fleet of devices with those applications being stored within your corporate network. The key thing here is that the edge device needs to be able to route to those application stores. So as long as you can tell the edge device where to route to to grab the application, you don't have to store that application in the cloud. It gives you flexibility to control the risk of your solution. Now, before I move on from this slide, it's important to note, this is just the orchestration and management plane, and this is gonna look the same. You know, copy-paste this 100 times across all of your devices. Um, it's not gonna change very much. What will change is the data plane and the applications you actually decide to run on the edge devices. This is showing an example view of what it would look to manage an entire fleet of devices. You can see you know, who's connecting to the devices, what software version they have, where in the world they're located. 
Um, you know, in industrial environments, it's not uncommon for devices to be powered off, maybe between factory acceptance test and site acceptance test. They may spend several months in a shipping container. And, you know, if you're looking at the management while they're offline, they might show up as an unknown software version. But maybe there was a critical vulnerability that came out while those devices were in shipping. You can still push that update and say, you know, my entire fleet needs to get this version. And as soon as those devices get powered on, they'll reach out to the management engine and say, oh, there's a new update. So before it does anything else, it's going to be patched and up to date. So you have that confidence that, you know, things aren't being pulled out of a closet or, you know, in a circular economy being repurposed from something and not getting updates. You'll be able to see the status of your devices at all times. The apps themselves also pose a risk. Just like the consumer mobile devices, the industrial Internet of Things has app stores. And you can decide which apps you want to deploy and configure. Just like you have maybe an IT approved software list for your engineering machines, you can have an approved app list in your industrial environment. And you have to decide who in your environment should be allowed to vet and add apps, um, you know, who should be managing this, who should be able to see and deploy apps. And this, you have a lot of flexibility here. You can control who can access what, who can deploy what, and you know, consider this may require new policies and procedures. Does your vetting of an OT app differ from an internally developed app versus something you get from a partner or a vendor? Do you trust apps more or do you have a test bed that you run them in just to verify that they're gonna be approved for your environment? This is an example of that use case of just sending data from the OT network in that information model up to the cloud. And it kind of gives you an idea of all the different options you have of various databases and places you can send that data to. It's not an exhaustive list, but it just gives an example. You probably noticed from my example that all of this data is flowing one direction. If you are considering deploying an application that has any sort of write backs or two-way data flow, I would really advise you to look at like a consequence-driven cyber-informed engineering, some other risk assessment methodology to really make sure you understand the impact to that cyber-physical system. But this is an application today that can securely get data out of your OT network. And you see, you know, it, it's got the multiple layers of firewalls, everything's, you know, keeping those critical systems isolated. This next slide is extremely important for security people to understand. Even with a relatively simple cloud application, it's already a multi-cloud implication, whether you wanted it to be or not. You have content delivery networks that are preventing your system from having a distributed denial of service attack. You need those. But you don't always get to control where they are or whose cloud they're living in. Um, in this example, um, we're using Orchestration and management is showing Zdata's cloud. That's living in Azure. So is Rockwell Automation's cloud. There's also pieces that you know, may live in Google's cloud and it might surprise you. Um, so for example, if you're trying to debug um, a new installation and you're looking at the management plane and you're like, why is this widget not rendering? Maybe that widget wasn't that map showing you where in the world all your devices are. That's actually calling out to Google Maps API in Google's cloud. So it's not just a, you know, a simple matter of taking you know, port 443 and opening that from your corporate firewall. You need to actually open up DNS routing to all of these different cloud systems. And it's not necessarily you know, something that's secretive. You can you know, monitor the traffic and learn this. But it, there are things that you, know, you have to be concerned about, particularly in like a GDPR world where you need to know what countries your data is going to, uh, who can access the data, where is it stored. These are all questions you need to be asking your vendors as you're vetting these solutions. As I mentioned in my example, all of the data flow was you know, one directional kind of data diode-esque, pulling the information out of your OT network and passing it over to the cloud. But there are many valid use cases for allowing simple writebacks. Uh, for example, you know, 
it could be beneficial to allow your MES system at the end of a recipe to write a few tag values back to the controller to change recipes. That would be very nice to do through an edge application. Um, similarly, closed loop control has a lot of value to be able to do you know, machine optimization, process optimization, energy optimization, and send that back down to your devices. But you have to consider you know, how are you maintaining that thread of user authentication and authorization through that entire process? And how are you, you know, how are you controlling all of those risks back down to your system? Like I said, you know, multi-cloud is only gonna become a bigger and bigger issue uh, that you need to understand for your routing because it makes your firewall rules and your routing way more complex. And you know, who owns the data? Do you as the asset owner own the data? Who needs to be able to access the data? Is it coming from your vendors, your machine builders, your system integrators? You need to have a plan for how you're going to address all of the data access concerns. Now, before I open it up for questions, I did wanna say a quick thank you to two of my colleagues, Mike Anthony and Vetus, who were super helpful as I put together this presentation. If anyone wants to ask questions live, there's a mic in the middle of the room. Hey, thanks for uh, reminding me about the TPM uh, around the world issue. A question for you on the write back uh, yep. idea. Do you see a threat model that um, would favor having the ability to sever write backs but still keep the, the flow up to the cloud going? Um, uh, yeah, I mean, I could see if you had, if you were in a, like, uh, if your IT systems, for example, were under attack, or if you had some reason to maybe not trust your um, user identification and authentication system, you might want to distrust anything that would allow write-backs because you're relying on that system. So, one of the things that I think still to this day scares people is the idea of the close to or closer to real-time updates to these edge devices. Mm -hmm. You know, in your traditional model, um, you know, patching during turnarounds and downtime and things like that, that's kind of the normal state of things. Right. Um, how do you see this reality, which I would say is probably an unavoidable reality, whereas we get closer and closer to this real-time patching, uh, affecting how we transform our thought process from that shut everything down uh, we're in turnaround mode, patch things, if, if it makes sense, which we were just, uh, I was in a, a session earlier where it was, you know, make sure you're patching what makes sense to this new model where you're kind of patching everything all the time, close right. to real time. Yeah, well, one thing I didn't mention with the patching is you can schedule the patches per device too. So it, a lot of it depends on what the actual applications you're deploying to the apps are doing. If it's really just data collection and it's not critical to the operations, and that you don't have a particular reason to avoid patching immediately, I mean, you could schedule those right away. But if you're doing something that you know, may require a machine to be down or may require you know, some coordination with the plant, um, you can schedule that to be, okay, I know the shift ends at this point, I'm gonna do the update at two in the morning, um, that works too. I, I think we're going to, as an industry, um, become more aware of what the dependencies are uh, and part of it is knowing, you know, what the impact is to any change to those devices. Yep. Are you aware of any statistics that uh, tell us the number of ICS customers that are actually implementing cloud? <laughs> I am not. No, I don't have statistics on that. Yeah, because we talk to customers in a lot of cases. They're like, I'm not connecting my ICS to a cloud. And you talk to others that are more agreeable. I'm wondering if it's still in the early stages or whether it's starting to gain traction more. I think it depends on industry and regulations because a lot of the regulated industries are just way more cautious on it. And um, yeah, there's others where you know they really want to be able to have full fleet visibility to what's going in with all of the data in their operations. So you mentioned the uh, hardware root of trust. Yep. So from a Rockwell perspective, are all your product lines uh, moving toward having hardware root of trust as a foundation for this area of, uh, you know, verifying uh, 
firmware and software on, on top of it, and then also for the uh, patching process you have. Yeah, we, we've built hardware root of trust into all of our modern products for years at this point, just because it's required to be able to get certificates provisioned into the devices and get um, secure device identities in the devices. Um, in terms of the edge devices, we don't necessarily require that customers buy the edge compute device from us. If they do buy it from us, then yes, we would pick a device with a TPM, although you know, if we're selling in China, we obviously can't sell them that. Does Rockwell have a uh, certification program for vendors like Atorio to be going on to your edge devices in a containerized fashion and being able to give guarantees to customers? Is there, is there a program for that today? Um, I'm not sure if we have an established program for it. We do have an app marketplace that vendors, could, partners could potentially get approval to have apps hosted in. Um, I don't know what the timeline on that is. Yep. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you.